just want to welcome you all to our second session with Core Bishop John Ferris, who's the pastor of St. Anthony Church in Glen Allen, Virginia. And his topic tonight is Eastern Canon Law. So before we get started, we're just going to offer a prayer. We just want to welcome everyone and your time and your presence is really a gift. So hopefully you'll find this beneficial. Yes, let us pray. I'll take the prayer from our divine liturgy for the season of the cross. Let us quiet ourselves from our active day. Allow ourselves to be aware of the present moment where God is found here and now. And ask the Holy Spirit to come into this gathering of ours this evening, that we will have open hearts and minds. We'll be blessed by the words of Monsignor. We'll learn more. We'll grow. And we call on the Lord. You chose to be hung on the wood of the cross and made it a lighthouse to shine your light upon the universe. Give us joy and enlighten us when we see your resplendent light. Protect us in the shadow of your cross on the glorious day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Just a few words about Monsignor, uh, Monsignor Poor Bishop John. I call him Abuna. Um, sister mentioned he's now the pastor at um, down in Glen Allen, Virginia of St. Anthony Maronite Church, but he has quite a, an extensive history. I told him I'm not going to tell all of it. It's quite impressive, but just some highlights. He was ordained in 1976 for our ep the Eparchy of St. Maron and then a core bishop in 1991, but he has served, studied in Rome and served not only our eparchy, but the Catholic Near East Welfare Association, that's where I first met him, <laughs> and the Pontifical Mission for Palestine. He was also president of the Canon Law Society of America. He also teaches at the Catholic University as a, a professor in Canon Law, in addition to being pastor. And I know you teach at the seminary. I don't see that on here, but um, you teach the seminarians as well. Mm -hmm. Monsignor recently finished an extensive work uh, and has written on Eastern canon law, but has finished an extensive work on Eastern canon law, um, a commentary on the Eastern code of canon law. So there's many things we could say that you have accomplished uh, and contributed to the church. But I know tonight we'll reap some of that as we listen to you. So welcome again, Abuna. Mm -hmm. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for, could I ask before we do anything else, could I ask everybody to mute themselves now? So we'll just, we'll just do that now. And then I think that'll be easier for everyone to, uh, we won't have so much um, interruption. And I, I must say that I feel bad for all of you because this is the best thing you could find to do on an evening. There's nothing else on television other than this. Okay, well, we'll begin. I, I'm going to, this is kind of a bait and switch because I was asked to talk about Eastern Canon Law, but I have to talk about some other things. There's some backstory. Let's first of all ask a very fundamental question. Why does the church have law? After all, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So why does the church have law? Well, my quick answer is, if we were all angels, we wouldn't need it. If we were all angels, we wouldn't need to have any kind of a law. But most of us have not attained angelic stature yet. So we need law to provide the earth, the, the church, with good order. You know, we have a law that tells us we drive on the right side of the road, and then we don't wreck into each other. We stop whenever we see one of those red signs that say stop. 
We go when it's green. At the, so those are laws. They're not offensive laws. They're not oppressive, but they are laws that we need in order to keep good order in the church. And also, keep this in mind. Anybody in power will advocate that we don't have laws. The people in power don't want us to have laws. The laws are there to protect the weak and the vulnerable against those who have all the power so that it cannot be used against them. Now, the Catholic Church has two bodies of law. The first is this Code of Canon Law, which is, I'll just open them up and let you see it, a collection of 1,752 laws. This one is in, you can see it's in English. The original is in Latin. So this is what your pastors would have. This is what the canon lawyers would have on their desk. That's for the Latin church. And this book, the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, it was promulgated or issued by Pope John Paul II in 1990 as the common law for all the Eastern Catholic churches, 24 of them. There are 24 Eastern Catholic churches. Now, this code has only 1,456 canons, while the Latin code has some 1,752. Do you know why? This code is the common law. And then it is supplemented. Each church has its own set of laws. The Maronite church, the Ukrainian Catholic church, the Melkite church will each have their set of laws we call particular laws to govern their particular circumstances. In other words, this would be like the federal law and each of the 24 churches would have state laws. Now, I have to explain a little bit of this to you. Um, and well, I'll, I'll, I, am I allowed to share screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so you're not gonna see my face for just a few minutes. That's something, that's not the screen I want to show you. Uh, share screen. Uh, new share. You see anything yet? No, it's still dark. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can do it this way. There we are. Stop sharing. I'll start over again. Excuse me. Okay. You, of course, we would expect this to happen. <laughs> now? Yes, yes, we can see it. Great, 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 great. Okay. My friends, this is a minor miracle. Now, to understand the Catholic Church, to understand the Church, we can go back to look at the Trinity. The Trinity is one and many. One and many. One God in three persons. The Church itself, the Church, like the Trinity, is an interaction between the one Catholic Church and the 24 churches that comprise it. Now, I keep using the word church a lot, and I will use it a lot in this lecture, because we Maronites need to understand something. We are not simply Catholics who are allowed to do things in a little different way. We are a church. We are a church with a tradition, an apostolic tradition. We were found by an apostle, and th in this church, we express our faith 
in the context of the broader Catholic Church. Our Maronite Church is in communion with the Pope, just as the Latin Catholic Church is in communion with the Pope. And because we're in communion with the Pope, we're in communion with all the other Catholics. So, there, as I said, there are 24 Catholic churches. One could describe our church as a communion of churches. One and many churches. Now, why so many churches? And I think you have this map here before you. Well, I'm going to go up here and down here, Jerusalem, the map is in French. It's the clearest map I could find, though. The church started at Jerusalem. The church was born in Jerusalem. We have the crucifixion, the resurrection, and Pentecost, all in Jerusalem. So that is the mother church. That is one church. But unfortunately, it was not a church that has long lived. In 70 AD, just as Christ predicted, Jerusalem was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed and looted. The temple was burnt. And by the way, the temple, the riches, the loot from the temple was taken from Jerusalem to Rome by the Emperor Titus. And they had a march through the forum with all the gold of the temple. And the temple loot was used to pay for the construction of the Colosseum. Well, the problem was you can't have a church in a place that's destroyed. So Christianity found a new center, Antioch. Antioch in its day was a combination of New York and Washington and Los Angeles all together. It was the center of the political center of all the territory to the east. It was the commercial center, very, very wealthy, culturally superb. In fact, in the 10th century, when Eleanor of Aquitaine, and she was the mother of Richard the Lionhearted, she went, had to go to Antioch to, uh, she was on a crusade. And they told her it was going to, it was time to go back to Paris. She said, why should I leave this splendor to go back to the mud pits in Paris? Okay, unfortunately Antioch, which is in Turkey today, uh, it's famous for its watermelons. Okay, Alexandria, Alexandria, now, I'll just say this now, Antioch, from Antioch, all of Asia was converted. All of Asia was converted. Christians had established themselves from Antioch to Mongolia. There was a, a Christian church from Antioch in Mongolia. So another center was Alexandria. Alexandria which is now in Egypt, was the second largest city on the Mediterranean after Rome. Now, Alexandria was evangelized by St. Mark. And he was responsible for the evangelization of uh, Northeast Asia. Or Northeast Africa. Um, the churches today would be the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, and the Eritrean Church. Then, as we know, Peter and Paul made it to Rome. Now, I want you to notice something. This is the Eastern and Western, right here, the line between the Eastern Empire and the Roman Empire, and the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western. The Western em Roman Empire had one apostolic see, one see that was founded by an apostle, Peter. The Eastern 
part of the empire had Jerusalem, naturally, Alexandria, Antioch, and then later Constantinople. Now, as I said, Antioch evangelized Asia, Alexandria evangelized Eastern Africa, Rome, which was the see of Peter, the site of the uh, martyrdom of Peter and Paul, evangelized Western Europe, all of this area. And the areas that were colonized by this, these people, Spain, France, Portugal, Britain, all of that, the Western hemisphere was Latin church because it was founded by a church that was founded by Rome. And then lastly, we have Constantinople. Now, naturally, Peter and the apostles did not see Constant, the other apostles did not go into Constantinople because it was only a village. Only in the fourth century did Constantine establish this magnificent city. Now, why did he create a capital in the Eastern Empire? Well, first of all, Rome was collapsing. Rome was on in, in the descent. It was going to completely collapse in 476. So he knew when the going was good and he went to he established a church in, in the capital in Constantinople. Now, one other thing about that. He wanted to make a uh, capital that was completely Christian. Rome was pagan with the Christian veneer. Constantinople was Christian from the foundations. And now we know, of course, unfortunately, it's under Muslim control, but we have Hagia Sophia, magnificent structures witnessing to the faith of Constantine and his mother. Now, Rome did Western Europe, Constantinople evangelized Eastern Europe. We hear so much about Ukraine. We hear about Moscow. Those were all areas evangelized by Constantine. Now, each of these places became centers of a church. And I have to tell you what happened then, though. In the fifth century, Antioch, Alexandria, Armenia, all broke away from the church of Rome and Constantinople over the nature of Christ in the fifth century. In the 11th century, Constantinople separated from Rome. And then, after, and I know I'm going fast, but I've, I've got to put, a, I've got to sing a 45 song, a 33 song at 45 RPMs. Now, so we have Constantinople separated from Rome, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, all separated from Rome. So Eastern Catholicism from the 11th century to the 16th century, disappeared. Eastern Catholicism, not Christianity. But then after the Council of Trent, there were missionaries who went to this area, all this area, and created small communities of Catholics and established a hierarchy with priests and bishops and patriarchs. So in Antioch, for example, you have a Catholic patriarch of Antioch, Maronite. You have a Syrian Catholic patriarch of Antioch. You have a Syrian Orthodox patriarch of Antioch, all representing their own churches. Now, uh, enough about the history. I think we'll, we'll stop about the history. Now, each of these, each of these um, churches developed their own traditions and ways of doing things. And when Rome 
established these churches, it said, okay, you're self-governing. You can take care of yourselves in every way that does not harm the Catholic faith, the unity of the faith. In other words, the Pope runs the Maronite church when it comes to faith and doctrine and preserving the unity and good order of the church. But we Maronites, like all the Eastern churches, have the power to govern ourselves. For example, um, let me pick somebody. Um, well, so this is the Maronite Sisters of Christ, uh, Christ the Light. You're in what diocese in? Capricorn no. St. Mary. Oh, the Fall River Diocese. Fall River. Right now. now, when the Fall River Diocese needs a bishop, how does that take place? Mm, through Rome. Through Rome. Rome appoints a bishop. Rome appoints a bishop. Now, when the Maronite Church in the United States needs a bishop, we have young bishops, though this won't happen for a very long time. <laughs> but when they need a bishop, how do we get bishops? Lebanon. Our bishops gather. Yeah. Our bishops gather and have an election. Sure. We elect our bishops in union, in union with the patriarch. We elect our bishops. Now, when the Maronite church wants to revise its liturgy, the Maronite bishops and the patriarch gather to revise the liturgy. It's reviewed by Rome, which I think is a very good thing, by the way. Um, but we take care of our own affairs. We take care of our own affairs. Much of what all you hear in the news about this law or that law doesn't apply to the Maronite church, doesn't apply to the Eastern Catholic churches. I need to give you a little caveat. There is only, there are only 15 million Eastern Catholics. Only 15 million total. There are a quarter of a billion Eastern Orthodox, and there are 1.2 billion Latin Catholics. So we Maronites are caught in the middle of this very large ocean of either Orthodox or Latin Catholics. Now, in the United States, we need to be very, very sensitive to the order of our church, to the authentic celebration of our sacraments, because that helps give us an identity. If we imitate the Latins, if we imitate the Latins, which have a beautiful tradition, but if we imitate them, well, we could just save time and let people go to the Latin church. There's our reason for existence in this country is to bring the Maronite tradition to the broader tradition of Eastern Catholicism. And the, the church, I know another way we want it, we want to explain how we govern ourselves is that we can resolve our own difficulties. Sometimes in, in the Latin church, if there's a problem between bishops and priests or bishops and nuns or bishops and bishops, it goes to Rome. The Maronites, I saw you look at each other, sisters. <laughs> uh, the Maronites, we can resolve our own problems. We can resolve our own problems. We decide on the validity of marriages and things like that. Now, I'm going to stop here for one reason. I want to be able to respond to not the questions I have, but the questions you have. So you can either present them in by chat or just ask them. Unmute yourself and ask them. Oh, 
Abuna, just so you know, we've been infiltrated by the Melkites. We we are privileged to have Bishop Samra on. I think I saw his name yes. come up. No, I don't think it's Bishop Samra. Oh, okay. It is, it Bishop, is it Bishop oh, Nicholas? No, Bishop, I think it is Bishop Nicholas. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's a, that's a different Bishop. Oh, hello, Bishop Nicholas. Oh, okay. Very good. We've been infiltrated by Orthodox. Oh, oh even, even better. better. <laughs> We've been infiltrated by Orthodox, but we still love them because God says we have to. <laughs> For sure. Maybe I can kick us off with a question, Father John. Surely. Okay. Um, so when we think about Eastern canon law um, mm -hmm. and the way it's been written, um, would you say that the way it's been written is um, more technical, user-friendly um, than the uh, Roman law. I wasn't. I'm, I haven't actually done a comparison, or I haven't really learned too much about you know the differences and and maybe the way they've been written and how they were influenced in in the writing of of our Eastern canon. Law. Actually, and this is not me being Eastern and bragging, uh -huh. but the Eastern code we call them codes, mm -hmm. is a better set of law for a few very practical reasons. Mm -hmm. One is we came out seven years after the Latin code. So we learned from when the Latin code was being implemented and criticized, well, we learned from their mistakes. We learned from their mistakes. Um, and another reason why it's better, it sounds very, very strange, we had word processors. So the word used in one place is consistent throughout. In doing the Latin code, they didn't have this. The other thing is, I thought you were gonna ask me is this. Here's the Eastern code. Now it's, it works for Armenians, Coptics, Maronites, Greeks, can anybody see the language? It's Latin. Why would this code be Latin? Well, it was, it was decided it had to be in Latin because it came from a Roman law tradition. And words mean certain things. And the problem would be if we didn't do it in Latin, what common language would we have? Anybody have any ideas of what language would be useful? Because if we're Greek, well, we have about 300 Greek Catholics in the world. So nobody could read it. So we had to have a common language and it, one would think it could be English because English would be a very common language. Uh, but in the church, English doesn't have such a tradition user-friendly, um, well, you know, you got to keep me in a job. If you made it real user-friendly, you wouldn't need canon lawyers. But um, you have to understand the law and the system. Okay, uh, you, you know, you could say all of us have freedom of speech, but we have a restricted relative freedom of speech. We can't say anything. We can't scream fire in a theater. Okay. And we, you know, we have 10 bills, the 10 rights, the Bill of Rights, and we've been working for 250 years to try to figure out what it means. So that's the church. The church in the code also has at the bottom of each canon is the sources of law, previous laws of previous laws that this is based upon. So it's not just starting something new, but based on a legal tradition. Okay. So, thank you, Father. We have a few other questions. Um, the first is, is the Eastern code available to the laity? Yes. Yes. And in fact, if you write to St. Marin publications, we have them. Mm -hmm. We have them. And I know somebody who can get your special price on that. Okay. It's available to the lady. Yes. Awesome. Another question from Kathleen. What is the table of contents of the Maronite canon law? 
Put another way, recount for us the various areas of law detailed in the book of the Maronite Canon Law. Okay. Uh, the, we, it's called the Particular Law of the Maronite Church. And I think that the last one was maybe 2002, the last edition. And what they would deal with is, for example, because this code would not deal with such detailed, um, are we supposed to have liturgy every day? What are the priests supposed to wear? What, uh, where is the priest supposed to live? How is the bishop supposed to uh, appoint a priest? Can they be appointed forever? Do they have to be appointed for a certain amount of time? What are the rights of the bishop with regard to money? Okay, can he spend anything he wants? And what are the rights of religious in the, uh, in the church? I, I, since, since we do have religious here, maybe I can say that for a minute. The oh, Eastern, Eastern Catholic law, and the only way I can say is it's schizophrenic because it says in the table of contents, monks, and it's in, in, in title uh, 12, monks and other religious. So the whole time it goes with, deals with monks and other religious. Why? The authentic tradition in Eastern religious life is a monastery. An independent monastery, a community of men or women living subject either to the patriarch or a bishop. That's what they do. But in actuality, in actuality, we have in the Eastern churches, congregations, orders, provinces, and confederations. So the Eastern Code has to say what things in theory should be and what they are in reality. In Lebanon, they have three orders, but those have evolved because of Latin practices. But the authentic um, Eastern tradition is just to have a monastery. Uh, now, so the Maronite canon law would parallel this code with greater details, with greater details. Um, I think that the church that has done the best in writing particular law, it's not the Maronites. It's the Indian church, the Cyril Malabar church. They have been very careful and done it carefully. The Maronites, it's a little bit, and the, the Lebanese here will understand, a little bit machluta, okay? A little bit machluta, good and bad. The other thing I'd like to talk about for a minute because it's, it's a topic today, are women deaconesses. Okay, and I get asked with every dogfight I attend, were there deaconesses, women deaconesses? As in, in a way to try to understand how, if there should be Latin deaconesses. The problem is, is that the Maronite deacon is a different bird, a different animal, than the Latin deacon. The Maronite deacons, Eastern Catholic deacons, do not administer sacraments, as do the Latin deacons. So I always say when you're looking to find out if there are married deaconesses or women deaconesses, go to your Latin tradition. Don't try to seek it out here because it won't be helpful. It just won't be helpful. Uh, does the Maronite particular, does the particular of the Maronite church involve itself with divorce or dissolution of marriage as with the Latin church's marriage tribunal? Not divorce. The Catholic church doesn't have divorce because that means it ends a marriage. Okay. What we have is an annulment, which means that the church examines the marriage that was attempted. 
And it says, did they really enter into a true marriage or not? And sometimes the couple, the, the church will say, no, this wasn't a true marriage. They just didn't understand what they were doing. For example, if two 12 year olds got married, we would look at it and say, no, that's not a marriage. That's not a marriage. So an annulment, the church doesn't annul marriages. It declares that it never existed. And the church cannot dissolve a marriage that is sacramental and consummated. The Pope can't do that. It can declare a non-consummated marriage dissolved or a marriage that involves a non-baptized person, which isn't sacramental. <coughs> I know I'm saying so much. Are there Eastern canons that contradict the Latin canons? No, contradict would be a bad word because it's made by the both same legislator. But there are, la there are many laws that are different than the Latin code. For example, I'll give you something that's going to kind of scandalize you. In the Latin code, they say that the material for the Eucharist is what? Bread and wine mixed with some water, right? That's, everybody knows that. Except that the Armenians don't do it that way. The Armenians have bread and water, bread and wine, to which water is added way after the consecration, hot water. So this code will not talk about water. It will only talk about bread and wine. Okay, so there's not contradictions. There are differences though. Okay, can you speak about the, oh, this is good. Paul, how are you? Paul is a very, very smart man. Can you speak of the relationship between the congregation of the Eastern churches vis-a-vis -vis the patriarch and the eparchies in North and South America, Brazil, etc.? Now, every patriarch, every patriarch has limited jurisdiction. It's to a certain territory. Every, every bishop and patriarch have that. Now, so what do you do when a bishop comes outside that territory? Well, the Pope had to figure out how to keep the connection between the territory, the bishops in the territory and the bishops outside the territory. So the code wrestles with every problem. What the code says is that if the Synod of Bishops enacts legislation on liturgy, it goes throughout the church. If it enacts on discipline, it's only in that territory unless it is enacted by the Holy See and approved by the Holy See. Now, the Congregation for the Eastern Churches is a department in the Vatican. And it's written, uh, uh, directed by a man named Cardinal Sandri. Cardinal Sandri is the, the bishops outside the territory, and even the bishops inside the territory, all of the things that have to go to Rome, dealing with the Eastern churches, go through Cardinal Sandri. I don't think it's a good idea to have it this way. I think that that office should be moved out of the Vatican so that it doesn't look like it's just a part of Roman administration. But the Maronite, the congregation, directs the affairs of the Eastern churches vis-a-vis -vis Rome. Now, are there any Maronite canons defining or restricting the role of women in the church? For example, is there a Maronite legal prohibition in having female altar servers? In the particular law, there is not. In fact, in Lebanon, there is. There are servers. Now, this may make me very unpopular, but I'll, that just means I'll get more nasty emails, just more. 
what we have to keep when we ever discuss, and we need to be discussing it now when we're talking about the synod, is the role of women in the church. Okay. What happened after Vatican II that created the permanent diaconate? Okay. We had all these wonderful laymen working in the church. So what did we do? Is We went back and ordained them all deacons. And that is kind of reinforcing a prejudice that in order to have responsibility and a role, a significant role in the church of service, you have to be ordained. And I'm saying you don't have to be ordained. And that's where we really need to be exploring. Beyond ordination, beyond ordination, what are the areas of service in the church? I will bring up the women religious again. I think that the religious, especially in North America, you have a very unique role. You have to be the prophets. You have to be the ones to say, the emperor has no clothes. When it comes to racism, when it comes to all these things affecting society, the bishop sometimes cannot speak. Or the priest cannot speak because they're subject to the bishops. So you need the monks and the nuns and the religious exercising a certain independence using a prophetic voice. Now, my point with um, altar servers, women, uh, girl, female altar servers. First of all, I must say the girls would do it better. Period. They would be less fussy. They would carry themselves better. They would just do it. But unfortunately, unfortunately, if you brought the girls in, the boys would be walking away within six months. And I'm not saying that as, as any, it's a very practical way of just saying, I think we need boy altar servers, male altar servers to nurture vocations. That does not mean that girls do not, vocations to the priesthood. What about readers? What about cantors? We need to have those in the church. There are many, many significant roles that women can and must exercise. And we all know it. I mean, I'm sitting here with a funny collar on, but the women run this church. The women run the church and I'm not, and do an excellent job. Okay, more questions. Uh, in reference to your previous comments, what would prevent a bishop or priest from speaking? It deals with the politics of the situation. Sometimes there are many groups that he has to keep in the fold, but somebody that's not beholden to anybody can stand up and speak. You know, I, I, I just think it's with, with many of the issues going on now today with human freedom and things, sometimes we need the religious to stand up and speak. Sometimes when you, you say a priest, sometimes you need a person to tell the bishop, no, you're wrong. And the priest can't do that at least publicly. But the lady can't? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. But sometimes the lady are not always aware of what their, um, what the issues are. And sometimes the religious have a broader audience he she actually wrote can father john just so you know it wasn't can and, and i want them to i yeah. want them to but sometimes the the laity at times sometimes you have very well informed laity mm -hmm. you see this is where oh, i'll give you another example canon lawyers 
I don't want priests to be canon lawyers. I think canon lawyers should be laity. I think they should be laity. Let the priests do important work, not this work of the canon lawyers. So the canon lawyers that I have, you know, directed for doctorates, for example, they're laypersons. They're married and they're doing wonderful work. Now, I previously mentioned that the deacons in the Maronite church do not administer the sacraments. What are the Maronite deacons called to do? They, can, they have a liturgical role, a liturgical role in connecting the priest with the people. That, you know, that's what the role of the deacon is. Announcing to the people, now stand, we're going to read the gospel, and those kinds of things. Not baptizing, not marrying, not confirming or chrismating, okay? And then outside the church, when I'm outside the liturgical context, I would very much like to see deacons go back to the original role of the diaconate diaconia, serving in the prisons, the hospitals, the soup kitchens, that they could be directly responsible to the bishop instead of at the mercy of pastors who come and go and expand or restrict their roles. Are there Eucharistic ministers in the Latin church who are not deacons? No, there are not, but they could be. There could be. Um, because the code allows for the Synod of Bishops to pass a law to allow others to uh, distribute the Eucharist, to be a minister of the Eucharist. Any of the abunas want to ask a question or even like the deacons or any comments? Father Jim Root, you've never agreed with me all my life. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> Who said I never agreed with you? <laughs> you think I'm crazy and I agree with you. <laughs> no, John, I think this is great because you put it in very simplistic terms and it makes it much easier for the laity to understand the role of the priest and the whole hierarchical structure of the church as well. And I like your, I like your ideas about the diac diaconate as well. I think it's, it should be studied further for us as well. And we, you see what I, I like is that, well, I've ordained some of you, I've ordained Deacon David as a subdeacon. So what I, in, in this parish, I like to have a subdeacon have a ministry. One takes care of the sacristy. Another takes care of the youth. Okay, to give them something that they feel competent and empowered to do. And I think that the priest, when they assign someone, ordained or non-ordained, to do something. This is law. I think that the priest needs to say to the person at that point, you are arranging for this, this, this event, this banquet. At that point, the priest works for the person. Yeah. The priest works for the person. The priest stands back and is available in case a problem arises and they're called upon. But I always tell the young priest, if the women set the table, and you walk over and rearrange the napkins. God help you. <laughs> you've discouraged everything. You've discouraged everything. Kathleen Kelly asked me, how can now ordained, how can ordained be Eucharistic ministers if the church teaches that the laity are not to touch the Eucharist? Is this changeable? Well, the church doesn't say that laity are not to touch the Eucharist. You can be a lay person and designated to distribute the Eucharist to the sick. 
for example. So just not touching the Eucharist. No, there's not, we are always to respect the Eucharist and not just to hand it around. But there's not a specific thing that somebody could not touch it. But we're not going to say, well, your mother's sick, we're going to send the Eucharist home with you. It's the greatest gift in the church, so we can't do it that way. Vivian also had a question, Father. Um, can you talk a little more about the pastoral care, care role of the deacons and subdeacons? I think that in the church today, one problem we, are, we have is 80% of our energy should be spent at the universities. We are ignoring the universities. It can be a university with 60,000 students and one Catholic priest. That's where they're learning. That's where we're losing Catholics. That's where that we're lose, people are losing their faith. We need to put all of our energy, all of our energy in the, um, in the universities. Now, why not put the deacons there? Why not have a deacon, many deacons, serving in different capacities. How can we reconcile consider considerations that our church leaders with, live with, not that prevent them from speaking what they know is authentic Christian teaching, which Jesus' way of speaking the truth? Are our church leaders led by the voices of female, religious, and laity? Not exactly that. I think that you're, you're, you're kind of misconstruing it. Sometimes, Okay, I'll give you an example. Sometimes I want, okay, we had a problem here that the young people were having, conducting breakfasts, but they weren't going to church. Okay, the problem is if I went in and said, okay, everybody go to church, that would, not get them into the church and that would kill the breakfast. But if I got one of the young people to say, listen guys, we really need to be going to church, it's more effective. And sometimes the prophetic message can sometimes be more effective in a different way. For example, Mother Teresa, I don't think she was ordained a deacon or a bishop or priest, but what was her moral authority in advocating for the poor? That's what I'm talking about. And in renewal of the church, now I believe that St. Francis was ordained a deacon, but it doesn't seem to be an important factor. These are the people speaking up and calling for renewal. Right. Amen. I'm not trying to dismiss the role of the priest or just say we're all kind, but sometimes the priest, you're just not in a position to do it. Father John, thank you so much. Um, this has really been a very insightful discussion and I'm sure there might be some other follow-up questions, but we're gonna have to wrap up here. Thank you. Uh, Father, we definitely have to have you come back <laughs> for a part two. <laughs> Anytime. Yes. And um, thank you for your questions. If you do have any follow-up questions, please email us. We just want to be conscious of people's time and uh, just a few announcements. So next week, we have Father Butros mm -hmm. Hashim, who is from our Utica Parish. He will be speaking on the season of the glorious birth. So hopefully you can join us. And uh, that will be appropriate because we'll be entering into that season very soon. And then we also have Monsignor Jim here. He'll be doing our fourth session on the Christmas Novena. So we'll be looking forward to that as well. Mm -hmm. And then as per usual, if you have any intentions or anything you'd like us to remember, uh, feel free to email us and we'll send tomorrow a follow-up of uh, this recording. And then also maybe we'll do a, a link to the Maronite publication St. Marin publication so that people can access. Sister, just to interject, sure. I think James Salami is here. 
Oh, yes, he is. Hello, Jimmy. Do you want to say hi? Hi, Jim. That's a canon lawyer. Hello. I was trying to uh, avoid being noticed, but yes, I'm here. <laughs> well, he, he's a lay canon lawyer. Yes. He's a layman who's working for the church, mm -hmm. definitely underpaid, but all of the time. <laughs> And um, that's the kind of kennel lawyers we need. I don't want to need more. I, I don't know that we need more of Jimmy Salamis, but we definitely need lay kennel lawyers. That's funny. <laughs> Father John, on that note. <laughs> on that happy note. Yes. Would no, you Jim like knows what I think of him. <laughs> He's one of my favorite people. Yes. And I love his wife too, Reem. Please tell her we say hello, Jimmy. I will. I will. Thank you. Yeah, you Sisters, will. thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, you're oh, very welcome. You. And if you don't mind just close us, closing us off with a prayer, we would love that, Father. There are several people uh, that I'm dealing with right now. A family just lost a 35-year-old son mm -hmm. to opioid suicide. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to, if we could say a Hail Mary, entrusting his soul to God and and asking God to give them consolation. Hail Mary, full oh, of grace, grace. the oh, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. And we definitely will remember that family as well in our prayer. Thank you. Thank yeah, you're you. You're welcome. Well, I wish everyone a good night and God bless.